Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming out uh, for the second lecture in our Lennox lecture series, uh, which is Reinventing the Bible. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, our co the co-organizers of the lecture series, Ruben de Pertuis and Brian Laporte. And we'd also like to thank the University Communications Department for helping us get the word out uh, about this lecture and all the other lectures as well. And finally, we'd also, of course, like to uh, thank the Martha, David, and Bagby Lennox Foundation for providing the funding for the lecture series. Uh, this series is linked to a, a course at Trinity University, which is also titled, titled Reinventing the Bible. And throughout the semester and also in the course and also in the lecture series, what we're trying to do is to look closely at how communities throughout history have created and recreated their Bibles and how the constantly shifting nature of authoritative texts, collections, and interpretations forces us to reconsider how we use terms like Bible or scripture or canon. Uh, I want to alert you to our next lecture, which is going to be on March 24th uh, at 6 p.m. In, in the same theater, Steering Theater. It's Valerie Ziegler of DePaul University, and it, it's up there on the, on the screen. Uh, the title of her talk uh, is Submission, Sex, and Sin Raptors, The Evangelical Adam as Alpha Male in American Popular Culture. Uh, and it should be a very interesting uh, talk. But now I want to shift to our, our guest lecturer for tonight, uh, Professor Annette Yashiko Reed, who earned her PhD at Princeton University and is currently an associate professor in the Department of Religious Studies and Program in Jewish Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Her research spans the Second Temple, uh, Second Temple Judaism, early Christianity, and Jewish-Christian relations in late antiquity. Her particular areas of uh, interest are angelology and demonology, the redeployment of Second Temple Jewish traditions in late antique Judaism and Christianity, and the parallels and overlaps between Jewish and Christian self-identification in late antiquity. Professor Reed is widely published in diverse areas of research. So for example, she is the author of a book titled Fallen Angels and the History of Judaism and Christianity. And she is also the editor of several books, including a collection about the relationships between Judaism and Christianity in the first few centuries uh, after the Common Era, which is called The Ways That Never Parted. Professor Reed is also the author of dozens of articles, including from Scripture to Slaughterhouse, Ancient and Modern Approaches to Meat, Animals, and Civilization? Was there science in ancient Judaism? And more directly related to the focus of the lecture series, last summer, Professor Reed published an article titled The Afterlives of New Testament Apocrypha, which he published in the Journal of Biblical Literature. We are delighted to have Professor Annette Yashika Reed with us this evening for her talk, The Bible Beyond the Bible, From Apocrypha to Anime. Please help me in welcoming Professor Reed. Thank you. Now, thank you to uh, to Chad, Reuben, and Brian for for their hospitality here. It's um, I've enjoyed my visit so far, and especially meeting with students, and I'm delighted to be here. So, thank you very much. What do we mean when we speak of the Bible and what defines its form, its shape, its core, and its bounds? From a contemporary perspective, the answers to these questions might seem too obvious even to stop and state. The Bible is self-evidently a book, one single book, which is bound and thus bounded as a set text and set of texts printed in a set order between two covers. It's a physical object that can be purchased, held in the hand for, with, for private ownership and use with a fixed form and stable materiality that embodies a stable horizon of the formative and normative past for Jews and Christians alike. Different versions, of course, proliferate, signaling the difficulties of rendering the original Hebrew and Greek of the Old and New Testaments into modern language such as English, as well as reflecting distinctions between Protestants, Catholics, and Jews. Like the various editions of the Bible tailored to individual readers at different ages and stages of life, these have become points, however, of variation on what is now a common form, thereby serving to highlight all that's nonetheless shared in the most pervasive understandings of the biblical heritage in the West, that is, as now embodied by the modern printed book. <clears throat> 
It's well known, of course, that the Jewish Bibles do not contain texts that Christians call the New Testament, and it's also well known that Catholic Bibles include additional deuterocanonical texts. And just as the multiplicity among Bibles is a matter of common knowledge, so too with the multiplicity within. It's often noted that our singular English term Bible paradoxically derives from the Latin plural, Biblia. What makes this paradox more than etymological trivia, however, is this power to remind us of a tension we habitually forget. All Bibles are collections of many different types of texts with many different dates and from many different genres. But by the common ideal and practice shared by otherwise diverse Christians and Jews, and common within secular settings as well, the Bible is one singular unified book, both physically and conceptually. Almost by definition, it's assumed to be so self-contained and stable that it can proof text are present. Unified despite its multiplicity, omnisignificant, self-referentially interconnected, and internally harmonious, with bounds so firm as to delineate all that's in, as wholly in part in the sense of being wholly different from other writings. Notably, however, this modern sense of the Bible would have been rather unimaginable during the ancient times that all the texts within the Bible first took form. Especially since the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's become clear that ancient Jews encountered scriptures as multiple and unbounded, a fluid complex of texts and traditions about Israel's past with a clear core in the Torah or Pentateuch, but without any fixed physical or anthological boundaries. Intertextuality and biblical interpretation served to evoke some sense of connectedness among scriptures. But ancient Jews also continued to textualize biblical memory in new literary forms, producing more writings claiming to be revealed and authoritative, sometimes with biblical forms or in the names of biblical figures, such as Enoch, Ezra, and Moses, with ancient voices thus called upon to give expression to changing local and lived remembrance of an increasingly elevated biblical past. And so too with the followers of Jesus and the earliest Christians, who doubled this past include the apostolic age alongside primeval precursors, patriarchs, and prophets of ancient Israel. To find a concern for fixing the physical boundaries of the Bible, by contrast, we must look perhaps as late as the fourth century CE to the dawn of the Christianization of the Roman Empire and the beginning of the Christian practice of making lists delimiting the precise contents of canonized scriptures. Until that time, the term canonized had not been applied to scriptures. And until that time, there were also no technologies enabling a large book-sized volume able to contain all the many writings, even in the smallest of biblical canons. Jewish scriptures were composed in an era of scrolls and continue to be copied as such. And the scribes who first copied the text that would become the New Testament were themselves influential in the repurposing of the Codex, the ancestor of our modern book, from a somewhat disposable medium for short-term purposes like note-taking into a format for preserving literary works for the long durée. This process seems to have begun with a copying of individual texts on papyrus, and at least by the third century, also involved the compilation of papyrus codices containing smaller groups of texts, like the letters of Paul, as in P46, or the four gospels and Acts, as in P45. Such anthological aims, in turn, may have spurred those technological advances needed to create large multi-choir codices of parchment thin enough to contain the totality of, of Christian canonized scriptures such that we see finally in the 4th and 5th centuries with Codex Vaticanus, Codex Alexandrinus, and Conet Sadaticus. It can be tempting to treat this moment, the 4th century closure of the canon, and the creation of these codices roughly contemporaneously as marking the moment that the Bible, as we now know it, came to be, as if finally and forever after self-contained and singular in its physical fixed form. Even in late antiquity, however, manuscripts of the sort remained far too expensive for frequent production, let alone personal ownership. So perhaps, too, for Bibles in general. From antiquity well into the Middle Ages, the main experience of scripture, after all, was not as words seen upon a page, but rather as words heard and remembered, with the biblical past shaped and situated much more by lived memory and communal life than by private acts of reading. To encounter scripture was typically not an act of holding a text or a manuscript in one's hand and seeing its words silently or privately upon a page. 
It was a matter of listening and participating in a public speech act, a matter not for the eyes and hand, but rather for the ears and mouth, for community and memory. Research on the formation of biblical canons has tended to take our modern notion of the closed and fixed text of the Bible as its assumed telos and culmination, tracing a thin line from the formation of biblical texts to their elevation and interpretation as scripture, to the shifting technologies of their transmission from scrolls to codices, and finally to the closure of biblical canons. If we want to understand the Bible before our modern notions of the Bible and beyond it, however, we must also try to imagine worlds before widespread literacy, before the advent of the print, before the mechanized ease of standardizing the text of books, before cheap and thin paper, before the widespread diffusion of anthology-style volumes, and especially before we could take for granted the ease of consultation of texts, as we do today in our digital age, perhaps more than in any age past. What might we miss then, both about the present and the past, when we focus on the origins of this one modern ideal of the Bible as a single set printed and bound set of books? In my time today, I'd like to reflect on this question from several different directions, experimenting with some different purviews onto the power of the biblical past. Instead of asking when the biblical canon was closed, my interest is in exploring some of the limits of the process of canonization, as well as some of the other ways in which the biblical past made cultural meanings, both before and after. My interest thus is in recovering some of what's left out when we trace a thin line from the closure of some Christian biblical canons in the fourth century to the printed Bible that we know today. My focus thus falls on mapping some of the varied and vast continuum of cultural creativity surrounding the biblical past and biblical memory outside the bounds of the Bible, both at its borders and beyond. For this, it's useful to look especially to those non-canonical texts that have been used to mark the boundaries of the Bible and to manage its multiplicity. That is, those ancient and medieval writings about biblical times and biblical figures that have been labeled as apocryphal in the course of debates about what should and should not count as canonized. These are the texts we now know as Old Testament pseudepigrapha and New Testament apocrypha, and the story of how they came to be labeled and collected as such may tell us much about the anxieties and controversies about the boundedness and singularity of the Bible, not just in antiquity, but also into modern times. The story of their reception, I suggest, is an important but neglected part of the history of the making of the Bible. Yet it also points us to the pivotal place of non-canonical texts and parabiblical literary production in shaping the reception of the biblical past from antiquity to the Middle Ages and into the present, both in the West and far beyond. Scholars of biblical studies have tended to tell the formation of the canon as a story that essentially ends in the fourth century. For us today, however, this is just the beginning of a story. It was at that time that Athanasius and other Christian ecclesiarchs created lists to catalog the precise contents of canonized scriptures, a category that he constructed through the, in part by the act of rejecting the authority of other received scriptures and categorizing them instead as apocrypha. These lists of apocrypha included texts associated with biblical patriarchs and prophets like Enoch, Moses, and Isaiah, what we now call the Old Testament pseudepigrapha, as well as texts associated with Jesus, his family, and his apostles, that is, texts we now call New Testament apocrypha. This cataloging for categorical exclusion from canonicity forms a major component of the, the consolidation of the Christian Bible in late antiquity. But what is striking about the reception of Apocrypha thereafter is that it doesn't stop. As Scott Fitzgerald Johnson has shown, Christian Apocrypha of the second and third centuries are actually well attested, extremely so, in Byzantine manuscripts. And in fact, we know most Pseudepigrapha and Apocrypha alike in medieval forms, often in multiple versions. However momentous the closing of the biblical canon may have been, it didn't succeed in delimiting the scope of biblical memory making to the textual bounds of a single Bible. Church leaders, of course, made lists of forbidden apocrypha from time to time thereafter, but they did so only sporadically, and their condemnations of text seemed to have quite a limited effect. Prior to the printing press, it was common for texts to become lost and forgotten when their manuscripts ceased to be copied. And there are numerous texts that we know only from names or excerpts. And this is the case, too, with a number of so-called apocrypha, 
Nevertheless, a great many still survive and continue to be transmitted nonetheless. And more and more, in fact, continue to be produced. Some were made through the process of redacting, expanding, and otherwise creating new versions of old materials such as in the case of the Infancy Gospel of Thomas about the childhood of Jesus, or the Protoevangelium of James in relation to the life of Mary. And we also find the production of new materials about apostles, such as in the case of the Apocalypse of Paul, which tells of Paul's journeys to heaven and the ends of the earth, and which dates precisely to the fourth century. So too with the Gospel of Nicodemus and the Pseudo-Clementines. When we focus on the question of when the biblical canon was closed, it can be tempting to presume that this multiplicity of literary creativity surrounding the biblical past should belong mainly to a period prior to canonization. Our evidence, however, suggests quite the opposite. Many of the most prominent apocrypha actually date to the fourth and fifth centuries, and our manuscripts for these and others are primarily medieval, often preserving their transmission in multiple different languages, both in late antiquity and especially in the Middle Ages. There were likely more apocrypha, in other words, at the end of the Middle Ages, not less, than in the era where Athanasius and others rejected such writings in the course of closing the canon. Partly as a result, many of these supposedly rejected texts survived well into the era of the emergence of the modern Bible as we now know it. That is, in the wake of the invention of mechanized printing in the 15th century and the inter-Christian canonical debates of the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. And even then, the most prominent canonical controversies would initially center on a different set of scriptures. Up until the 16th centuries, Bibles in Europe commonly included texts of the, New Tes of the Old Testament, not in the Jewish Bible, such as Judith, Tobit, Wisdom of Solomon, and 1 and 2 Maccabees. Protestant reformers, however, questioned their place in the Christian biblical canon, labeling and isolating them as what we now know as Old Testament apocrypha a term that significantly for our purposes had not been commonly applied to these particular works in ancient and medieval canon lists, except by Jerome. Controversies about those other scriptures that ancient and medieval lists more commonly cataloged as apocryphal would come to a head roughly a century later. Since the advent of printing, the contents of manuscripts from monasteries and libraries across Eurasia had become more broadly accessible bringing more attention to, to lost and rediscovered works and sharpening a sense of the possibility of even more ancient but lost knowledge hidden about the biblical past. By the turn of the 18th century, the trends had mounted to the degree that bibliographers, such as Johann Albert Fabricius, felt a need to distinguish these works categorically from the Bible. He did so most influentially by cataloging non-canonical works related to biblical figures and collecting and printing them as distinct anthologies. This effort marked the invention of the categories that we now know today as Old Testament pseudepigrapha and New Testament apocrypha, both of which were defined in contrast to the Bible in a two-fold division marking the Christian, mirroring the Christian Bible in particular. Seen from the perspective of his own time, these efforts form part of broader efforts to bring order to what Martin Muslow has called the information overload in the wake of the advent of printing. In this case, Fabricius drew upon technologies like bibliography, anthology, and printing to manage the multiplicity of the biblical past and to assert, by contrast, the firmness of the bounds of the Bible. He did so by cataloging and cordoning off and thereby controlling the rest of the received literary heritage surrounding biblical times and figures. By gathering diverse materials and labeling and framing them as false, he conveyed their separation from the canonical scriptures and in the process created new counter canons. The result was that an incredibly diverse variety of materials of different dates, forms, and languages were redefined as significant, not for what they were, but for what they were not, that is, not biblical and not otherwise akin to scripture. In doing so, Fabricius's twin anthologies functioned to answer those who were citing some of the very same texts to claim exactly the converse. Already in 1699, the Irish freethinker and deist John Tolan went so far as to compile an extensive catalog of books attributed in primitive times to Jesus Christ, his apostles, and other eminent persons. 
In this list, Tolan relativizes the Bible quite radically by pointing to a vast quantity of gospel-related and apostle-related sources that he deems as known to ancient readers since Luke. At the same time, he redescribes the closing of the Christian biblical canon not as an act of selection or preservation, but rather an act of suppression, conjuring an image of the fourth century ecumenical councils and the acts of Athanasius as, in his words, um, accounts where the prevailing party strictly ordered all those books which offended them to be burnt and otherwise suppressed. Tolan posited this closing of the biblical canon, in other words, as akin to acts of censorship in his own time, which in fact he himself knew quite well, because his own first book, Christianity Not Mysterious, had been censored and burnt as a result of its condemnation as blasphemous in a trial. Tolan's own notoriety, in turn, ensured that his notion of this suppression gained some traction, especially among those already suspicious of church and governmental authorities. Similar claims were made soon after by William Whiston. Today, he's remembered best for his English translation of Josephus, but he also translated some Old Testament pseudepigrapha and New Testament apocrypha into English under the title, A Collection of Authentic Records Belonging to the Old and New Testament. For Whiston, in this volume from 1728, he presented the books like Enoch and the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs as not actually pseudepigrapha at all. For him, they were authentically ancient works authored by these very biblical figures, and accordingly, their omission from the Bible was not a mark of their spuriousness, but rather a sign of their suppression. Such pseudepigrapha in his view thus revealed the truth about a biblical past onto which the Bible allowed only a small selective glimpse. And they also demonstrate the possibility of the survival of secret truths um, from the apostolic past as well, grounding his claims that the apostolic constitutions, for instance, preserved authentic but suppressed truths even about the teachings of Jesus. Although somewhat idiosyncratic, figures like Toland and Whiston pushed many of the trends of their time to their logical ends, and hence also to a point of contestation. Importantly, for our purposes, it was in reaction to their claims that New Testament Apocrypha came to circulate widely in print editions, not just in Latin anthologies, such as those of Fabricius, but also in vernacular languages like English. As part of his 1798 treatise on the new and full method of settling the canonical authority of the New Testament, for instance, the Welsh minister, Jeremiah Jones, bemoaned that the canon has been deemed unperfect by Toland and Whiston in particular, and in response, translates much of Fabricius's anthology of New Testament Apocrypha into English for the first time. Like Fabricius, he was confident that the simple act of translation and publication of these so-called Apocrypha would expose them to everyone as simple forgeries. His translations would become incredibly influential, but not quite in the way that he had imagined. They circulated in different forms, most notably due to their reprinting and repackaging in 1820 by William Hone as the Apocryphal New Testament, which in turn was repackaged yet again in the 1920s as the Lost Books of the Bible. The circumstances, again, are notable. Far from a scholar, Hone was a writer and a publisher, and he's best remembered for his contribution to mass market popular English language print culture. He came to an interest in Apocrypha through his turn through his satirists. After publishing parodies that used forms of church liturgy to attack corruption in the British government, he himself was arrested on charges of blasphemy and sedition and, and, he, and suffered three trials, all of which he fought and won. As a result, he gained local fame in London and beyond as a defender of the free press. His own interest in Apocrypha then was far from scholarly, but rather related to his aim to use the power of print to disseminate ideas that might otherwise be censored or suppressed. It was in the immediate wake of his own trials that he published his books related to Apocrypha, one a very affordable anthology of non-canonical texts, and the other a collection of English mystery plays that showed the influence of these texts. His anthology, the New Testament Apocrypha, was first published in 1820 and reprinted those writings translated by Jones alongside other materials translated by William, William Wake. The difference, however, was that he did so, as J.W. Robinson notes, in important formal form 
Neither Jones nor Wake's book even looks like a New Testament, but Hone subdivided their chapters into verses, provided summaries of the head of each chapter, printed two columns on a page, so that the result looks rather aggressively like an edition of the authorized version of the Bible. This claim to preserve an exact countercanon also comes through through his choice of title, namely the apocryphal New Testament with all the gospels, epistles, and other pieces now extant, attributed in the first four centuries to Jesus Christ, his apostles, and their companions, but not included in the Bible by its compilers. The very first line also placed these translations in quite a different context than ever imagined by Jones. After the, in his words, after the writings contained in the New Testament were selected from numerous gospels and epistles then in existence, what became of the books that were rejected by the compilers? Hone himself claimed to answer this question through his edition, and to do so he projected modern notions of censorship back into the Christian past, much like Toland, reimagining the fourth century closure of the biblical canon as akin to the acts of censors in his own time after the invention of the printing press. Hone claimed to publish everything that had been omitted, by contrast, such that he who possesses this New Testament, he claims, has in two volumes a collection of all the historical records relative to Christ and his apostles. What his apocryphal New Testament both stated and embodied then was a notion of apocrypha as total countercanon, an inverse mirror image of the printed Bible, similarly containing a set text and set of texts printed in exactly the same format as a single book under a singular title. And just as his ideas about the suppression of Apocrypha were predicated on distinctly modern technologies of printing and practices of censorship, so too with the products of his attempt to resist them, which mimics modern notions of the print Bible exactly, and, further, and as a result also further serves to naturalize them as well. In the 17th, 18th, and early 19th centuries then, much scholarly and popular interest in apocryphal literature thus centered on debates over the integrity of the Bible as defended by thinkers like Fabricius and Jones and questioned and relativized by thinkers like Toland, Whiston, and Hone. Despite their many differences, they operate under a shared assumption, namely that non-canonical writings are either late forgeries or potential sources for exposing suppressed truths. Whether negatively or positively, they construct Old Testament pseudepigrapha and especially New Testament apocrypha as counter canons, and they share the assumption their significance must pivot on their precise relationship to the written text of the Bible. These dynamics have been determinative for scholarly categories of Old Testament pseudepigrapha and New Testament apocrypha to this day. Among Christians in the Latin West, in medieval Europe at least, Old Testament pseudepigrapha didn't quite have quite the same history of continued transmission or deep influence on liturgy, pilgrimage, or art. Attention to these sources, however, does help us to highlight still other components of the biblical past as it flourished outside the text of the canonized scriptures or set Bible, in this case for both Jews and Christians. The example of pseudepigrapha associated with Enoch is again illustrative. These are perhaps the most ancient of what we now call Old Testament pseudepigrapha, and they're well represented in the Dead Sea Scrolls and cited as authoritative in literature from the New Testament letter of Jude to the writings of, Church, of the church father, Tertullian. Nevertheless, they were adduced as apocryphal by Athanasius and, and came to be lost to the West in the Middle Ages, even as they survived in Ethiopia. Although not part of the Bible today, these works too seem to have formed part of what James Kugel calls the Bible as it was during the age of the earliest Christians, especially as we know it from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Even despite their omission from Jewish and most biblical can Christian biblical canons, moreover, traditions from this text continued to circulate among Jews and Christians, as well as Manichees, Muslims, and others, especially in magical and other popular contexts, and even in locales where the books themselves do not seem to have been known in full. Here too, then, we might miss something about the history of Jewish and Christian reflection on the biblical past and acts of participation in its symbolic evidence when we look just to the Bible as printed book. At the very least, the dynamics therein may help us draw our attention to some of what we miss when we presume some smooth, inevitable stream of development connecting the closing of the Christian biblical canon and late antiquity on the one hand and the printed Bibles we know in the West today on the other.
Is there some sense then that we might productively speak of a Bible or the Bible beyond the Bible? On the one hand, we've seen how early modern constructions of New Testament apocrypha and Old Testament pseudepigrapha attempted to contain the multiplicity of non-canonical writings about the biblical past into a counter-canon of sorts, which still functions today as a nexus for speculation of what might have been suppressed. Like the limits of late antique canonization, however, the limits of such modern anthological efforts also served to remind us of the power of the biblical past, even beyond the bounds of texts and printed books including in the often fluid manuscripts of, of New Testament apocrypha and the productive interpenetration with art, but also in more contemporary media like manga and anime, film and fiction. Our modern notion of the Bible has its own history as we have seen, and we may learn much about this history by looking to its borders and beyond. But part of what we may learn is that perhaps this history is also part of a bigger story about the richly sprawling cultural significance of the biblical past in pre-modern times and modern times alike within and even beyond the West. Thank you. We have some time for questions. If anyone has any questions for Dr. Lee. <laughs> With respect to the New Testament Apocrypha, yeah. you were saying that uh, some people thought uh, in early on era that some of them were forgeries and maybe some of them actually had some value. Uh, when reading those yourself, what do you think of them? As being, uh, well, my interest in this material is not in terms of judging them in terms of their religious value, but more as a historian describing how they were received and how they function. So as a historian, I feel like they have a lot of value because they tell us what was important to those people who created and received them, and especially the ways in which they saw the past. Um, in terms of the category of forgery, um, I mean, I personally, I find that there's a concept of forgery that's very modern. Um, which assumes a concept of authorship that's very modern, and I'm not necessarily sure it's that helpful looking back in the past. Um, many, um, the, many ancient texts are associated with specific names, specific figures, but not necessarily with a kind of sense of an aim of deception, but more a sense of an attempt to convey connection to a tradition. And for many of these sources, I think that's, that's the way that they're better understood in their own terms, or it's kind of in their own world. but a bit differently when we come to a class. 
Uh, in Buddhist studies, the term apocrypha, what I guess, was borrowed, mm -hmm. uh, and and in, the, in that instance, it refers to texts that were uh, that were written in Chinese that purported to be translations of Pali or Sanskrit, but were in fact invented. And the problem was that there were some non apocryphal canonical gospels in Chinese that were translated from Sanskrit and Pali, but the, but the originals have been lost. Yeah. So the problem was distinguishing between the ones that were real translations and the ones that were invented and only pretended to be translations. So I guess the issue for Chinese Buddhists was the question of authenticity, meaning did these originate in India? Yeah. Okay, so is there some, is it parallel in the case of, of the Jewish and Christian Apocrypha? In other words, did they make the claim to being something from antiquity? But Because you mentioned that a lot of Apocrypha were actually composed post-canonization, right? So, so were they making the same kind of historical claim to some, some past or some origin or some original language uh, that, that the Buddhists? Yeah, that's an interesting parallel. I've actually always wondered why we find Buddhist, the, the term Apocrypha applied to Buddhist texts. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of, um, do you know how early that was? I mean, when did it start? Probably, probably uh, not maybe so the 6th century. Oh, no, no, yeah, when did the, the term Apocrypha become applied? Oh, I don't know about that. Yeah, I would just be curious to know yeah. what stage in like this history, oh, oh, right, for instance, right. that it became. Um, yeah. But in any case, I think that there it does some of the literature characterized as apocryphal is ancient, or just, just you know, relatively, um, it because of the fact that the production of them continues, some of it's late. So I think that they're not necessarily, um, they're not necessarily categorically imitations of earlier things. Um, although, um, I mean, I think it's difficult to, to, to define them in terms of their intention to pretend to be older than they are, because so much else also pretends to be older than it is. So I can, I can kind of see why, why the category would fit. <laughs> Although, I mean, one of the things that, um, well, I mean, like many scholars who study non-canonical materials, you know, I've been trying to kind of get away <coughs> from and experimenting with a different way of thinking about these texts that doesn't focus on the sense of, oh, is there intention to pretend to be something they're not? Which, in a sense, um, in terms of modern concepts of authorship, it makes perfect sense. It's, oh, you know, authorial intent is the core of how we should understand this text. Um, but once we get to this material, I'm not sure it's, if it's that, that useful. I'd be sure. I mean, I'm not sure. If it's sure, your example of the um, subtext, some of the, the Chinese Buddhist texts that are actually, you know, do have Pali or Sanskrit uh, counterparts, is a perfect example of that. Like something may seem to be only because we haven't figured out something earlier. So I think it's probably a similar set of problems, um, even as there does seem to be some you know, parallel activities going on. And notably, that type of literary production about the past also includes, is not limited to religious realms, even in the last. So. How did the pseudepigrapha and the apocrypha fit into, I assume that there's an Eastern Orthodox canon? Okay, how does the Eastern Orthodox canon treat the sort of bigger foot in the The, um, you know, I focus mainly on the reception in the West because partially that's been been a lot of the uh, a lot of the work that's been done um, in the Greek East um, and eastwards. Like the story of canonization, especially preservation of these older materials, is a bit different. Um, it doesn't fit necessarily within a canon. But some of the materials that uh, were rediscovered, you know, rediscovered, were rediscovered because they were in Byzantine monasteries. So it does in the case that there is a kind of less, like some of the, you know, the case of when we really focus on a modern printed book, a publication, some of that really is a kind of Western European story where we do find a bit more flexibility, although sometimes it's, it's difficult to tell. I mean, it's different, I mean, it's, um, there definitely are within, at least within Byzantine libraries, like more stuff is preserved. In some cases where they're rediscovered in modern times in the West, or, you know, it's because they've been found, those manuscripts have been found and translated. And for what it's worth, 
Western, you know, Christians in the Latin West knew that already in like the 13th and 14th century. They commented, oh, you know, there's more that survives in Greek that we don't have. So um, it's difficult to know for certain, but there is definitely some type of difference. So there isn't a kind of unified Christian perspective on this that, you know, can, um, and likewise, if we were to tell the same story from the standpoint of Armenia or Ethiopia or so forth, it would be quite a different story. I had a quick question. I, so you, you mentioned that in, in terms of the anime and uh, you speak up? in terms of the anime and ma manga in, the, in Japan, that it's it's not from their culture. Yeah. So why why these stories? Why did these become popular in the twentieth century yeah. in, in Japan? Uh, that's a good question. I think partially um, there's a lot of there's a lot of especially post war. There's a lot of interest in. Uh, apocalyptic eschatological themes, you know, it's like a Godzilla disaster, <laughs> you know, after, especially after the bomb. Uh, so there is like this case, I think, that these, especially like end time tales, that have a strong appeal, and that there's this kind of culling of them from throughout the world. And this is a case we see, I mean, it's not only, I mean, the Western ones tend to get fixed upon, but I also think there is something interesting about this kind of, uh, <laughs> like reversing the gaze on westernization. So the sense of like appropriating like western traditions and then remaking them in the same way that you know we see you know uh, happening in the west with like a number of eastern traditions. I mean, a case what I was thinking is like sometimes people look at these materials and think of them as flippant or reuse as flippant or so forth, but I mean you can go to like I don't know, a garden store and see like a statue of the Buddha their sense of Western materials are also quite Western perception of Eastern religious materials are also highly displaced for their own purposes and so forth. So I think it's part of this kind of tension of globalization. So, but in this case, very kind of productive, productive tension or interesting tension. We have time for one more question, if there is one. <coughs> yeah. Do you know of any cases where, say, these anime or comic versions have taken on a sense of piety or sacredness in communities? I do not. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I mean, there are cases where there are attempts to create more pious manga. Um, so, uh, kind of alternatives to these. Uh, but I don't know if they've really caught on okay. or if they're just kind of attempts to try to, try to um, ensure that there can be, for instance, you know, man manga type works that are more kind of Christian or so forth. Yeah. So, but I don't actually know much about the popular. I know they exist. I don't know. I don't know how widespread they've been in practice. Yeah, I was just imagining that, say, someone isn't yeah. familiar with the <coughs> a bound New Testament, but they get these texts, and if that ever took on religious value. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's thank Professor Reed again.